Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Under the Gold Dome. My name is Roger Bruce, and I'm the state representative from District 61. We're celebrating Black History on Month. And uh, one of the things that I want to make sure that people knew and kept uh, in their memory is the fact that years ago, uh, during the Reconstruction period of time, we had 32 members, black members, of this General Assembly kicked out of the General Assembly simply because of the color of their skin. And this uh, monument is uh, for, to provide memory of what happened that day. Um, all of these people, simply because of the color of their skin, they were denied their right to serve, even though they were elected. And uh, so that's what this commemorates. This, will, this particular piece over here, when you visit the Capitol, I want to make sure you come and you see this, because it's important to know your history so that you get some understanding of what your future uh, could, could be. This thing sat out in, in the weather for years and years, and it was damaged very, very bad. And uh, so a group of legislators several years ago, including myself, we decided to raise the money to rededicate this. And that's why it looks fresh and clean now, because we wanted to do it. And uh, so here's, here's the individuals that were involved uh, in, in getting this thing refurbished. All of the names are here. And uh, again, I wanted to encourage you, if you come to the Capitol, to take the time to come and see this and read uh, about the history of these individuals uh, being uh, thrown out of the legislature simply because of the color of their skin. Hi, I'm State Representative Roger Bruce, and welcome to this week's edition of Under the Gold Dome. Uh, today, we're going to have a very interesting conversation about black history, uh, and we're going to go to a different level, because normally we talk about the same uh, individuals uh, when we talk about black history, but uh, today we're going to talk about uh, people and things that you may not have known about. And to help me do this, I have three individuals uh, that uh, two of them deal with history, and uh, one is historic in, in his own right. Uh, so why don't we start with you and just kind of tell them who you are and who you represent, and we'll keep going. Yeah, my name is Rodney Strong. I'm a lawyer here in Atlanta. Uh, my firm, Griffin & Strong PC, uh, works all over the country with uh, cities and uh, state governments, helping them develop minority and women business programs. And uh, I developed that experience having worked for Manny Jackson and Andy Young as Director of Contract Compliance for the City of Atlanta uh, in the early stages of my career. Hello, my name is Ann Vanessa Harper. I'm an educator at Langston Hughes High School located in Fairburn, Georgia. And my primary focus is U.S. history. All right. Hi, I'm Eleanor Ross. I am director of the Heritage Project. We're a nonprofit organization that teaches audiences about history and culture, facilitated through exhibits, media products, and public programs. We've actually been in existence now for almost 30 years. And um, I'm currently curating an exhibit called Georgia's Great African Americans of Historic Distinctions that is geared toward public, uh, school age audiences, as well as adults. All right. So given that, you know, as you can see, we have three individuals that can contribute to this conversation greatly. And uh, so why don't we start out with, with the idea, this whole concept of Black History Month, uh, it, that in and of itself is kind of, to me, a little misleading because it implies that we can fit all of our history in the shortest month of the year, and uh, which is obviously not the case. So why don't we just talk about, I saw your uh, exhibit. Yes. Why don't we talk about a few of the things that, that are in that exhibit, some of the uh, people and some of the uh, incidences that you, uh, that you had on the exhibit. Indeed, thank you. You know, we, we exist 12 months out of the year. We actually uh, focus on uh, just 11 months because the month of December is off our calendar. But one of the reasons that we exist is to extend the concept of Black History Month. Uh, actually, our focus is American history, and so all history contributed by African Americans really reflects, right. you know, American history. Right. And we'll so, we'll talk about some of the, the things that you in the exhibit yeah. we feature 
uh, eight individual eight individuals and three panels. Um, we feature a young man who was the first African American to graduate from West Point. His name was uh, Is that Henry Flipper. Henry Flipper, yes. Okay. And we also feature uh, now, a gentleman. Henry Flipper is, is, is Flipper Temple. Henry, Henry Flipper's brother, uh, he was actually the youngest, the oldest uh, in a line of very successful brothers in his family. He, of course, again, uh, had a military career. He had a brother who grew to be very prominent in the AME church. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Flipper Temple is named after him. He okay. had another brother who became a surgeon. So it's two, two historic things. There. So absolutely, okay. absolutely. And then we have, you know, Henry Flipper was... Uh, was was actually put out of the army. He was mm -hmm. accused of a crime that he really did not commit, and he was dishonorably discharged. Okay. And so it wasn't until uh, Bill Clinton became president of the United States that they revisited that case and so gave him an honorable discharge okay. as a result. So I we owe a lot that, to, yeah. to Henry Flipper. As a matter of fact, a bust of Henry Flipper now sits on the uh, campus of okay. West Point. N name one more of, of the people that you I know. love um, the story of William and Ellen Craft. They okay. were from Macon, Georgia. Uh, William was a dark-skinned African-American. Ellen was a very bright-skinned African-American. And she they disguised themselves as a slave and master duo and uh -huh. escaped a plantation in Macon, Georgia, traveled all the way uh, to London, England, and lived there for 20 years being activists and fighting uh, for African Americans mm -hmm. to be free from slavery. They uh, finally came back to the United States to Savannah, started a school, uh, lived and worked there. In later years, they moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where they lived out the rest of their lives. Okay. So today, they still have descendants who are alive and well in Charleston, South Carolina. So that, 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 that particular story fascinates me because okay. it took a terrible amount of courage you know, to uh, disguise yourself and risk capture, which they did several times. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, you grew up in Tennessee, is that correct? Correct. And I I'm sure that you have some stories about Tennessee and, and, and you're growing up. Oh, no question about it. I mean, uh, you know, I was actually in Memphis uh, in the events of 1968, and a lot of people focus on Dr. King's assassination, but a lot of historic uh, events led up to Dr. King's assassination uh, in Memphis, uh, and there were a number of historic figures that I think are really important, one of which was Dr. Henry Starks, who okay. really led that movement uh, in Memphis, was one of the key leaders of that movement there, and some of the other people who were really instrumental in bringing Dr. King in. Of course, uh, this whole history of African Americans being brought uh, into that area and creating a whole slave economy mm -hmm. in that area is just a is just a rich history. T talk a little bit more about it. Well, uh, when uh, Andrew Jackson became president of the United States, he basically uh, decided to go on a genocidal campaign against Native Americans, wow. and they removed Native Americans from the Southeast United States. They marched them across the Mississippi River right at my hometown. In fact, you can walk from my house that I grew up in in mm -hmm. Memphis two blocks to the street that the uh, Native Americans were marched down. And there is now a memorial sign commemorating mm -hmm. the Trail of Tears. Many wow. people have heard about the Trail of Tears. Absolutely. And uh, once they uh, ethnically cleansed uh, that area, what they did was they force marched African Americans from Virginia into uh, West Tennessee and Northern Mississippi into the Delta mm -hmm. and created the whole uh, plantations and the slave economy there. Uh, in fact, both of my great grandfathers were forced marched from Virginia into that area and were among the original Africans that were brought in uh, mm -hmm. to that area. So I grew up in that area and, and my family's been there since it was first uh, cleansed of Native Americans ethnically uh -huh. and the Europeans and the African slaves were brought in. You know, it, it's, it's unfortunate. You know, all of us, if you listen to our names, our names don't represent any country that we came from. Absolutely. It doesn't represent our heritage, our background. And you know, here lately, a lot of people have been trying to trace their roots. Mm -hmm. And you know, we can't trace our roots unless we find a slave bill of sale, uh, for the most part, to find out who the last person was mm -hmm. that owned this. Mm -hmm. You are a professor of history, is that correct? Yes. 
And, you know, this, this is a personal feeling that our history has been changed, altered, eliminated, all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm, I'm convinced that 100 years from now, when none of us are here, Dr. Martin Luther King was probably a Caucasian that was helping some <laughs> black people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but am I, no, am I off on that? No, not at all. No. Okay. Talk, um, talk, about, talk about history and, and how that works. Well, I think it's a disservice to have a history month because we have contributed so much to America as a whole and to conduce it down to 30 days. And even in the classroom, it's optional. It's not in the it's curriculum. It's not even 30 days. It's the well, they have, ex <laughs> absolutely. It's optional to cover it. And the fact is, so much of it has been left out okay. purposefully. What, what are some of the things that you know that have been left out? Well, I remember Kanye West's statement that he said slavery was a choice. And that's because no one talked him about the gull wars that took place in Florida and parts of Southern Georgia where you had the African slaves uh, working beside with Native Americans having a uh, full scale battle against the United States military. Mm -hmm. And these things aren't discussed. You have the Battle of Negro Fort where you have a fort that was occupied by all Africans and a few Native Americans where you had uh, warriors fighting back and that was destroyed under President Jackson as well. So it was not like we were just submissive and okay with being enslaved. They were actively fighting. We have uh, revolts and it's actually omitted in official documents because think about it, if you are a slave owner and you read this newspaper and you see that there is this huge revolt and you are surrounded by 500 people of color, you may be afraid. Mm -hmm. And it is going to limit the amount of people that are willing to come here and settle because they don't want to get caught in that. So a lot of this information is purposefully hidden to make people feel secure in what they're doing. So how do we, how do we address this? Because I recently saw this movie about the three ladies that they, they, they were calling computers. Hidden figures. Hidden figures. Hidden figures. And uh, in that movie, I learned a lot. And they filmed that at my alma mater, by the way. They filmed that at Morehouse. And uh, your alma mater, too. Yes, sir. But, but seriously, that, that movie said a lot to me because those, that astronaut would still be floating around in outer space right now if that lady did not come up with, the, with, with, with what was necessary to bring him back. You, you familiar with the, the story? Indeed, I am. Talk about it. Hidden Figures, uh, the story of, of three women who were mathematical geniuses, quite frankly, who worked uh, at NASA under uh, conditions that were oppressive and suppressive. Uh, their talents weren't recognized until there was a need and someone was brave enough to step forward to offer their intellect and expertise on the subject matter. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of meeting the young lady that wrote the book, okay. quite frankly. She grew up uh, knowing these ladies and the fact that their stories were untold. Mm -hmm. And so she decided to write a book, then we're all so very, very excited and happy I that am. it became a movie yeah. because, quite frankly, when I saw it, I was mesmerized. I didn't know I that that kind of talent existed. And, and, and like I said, if not for those ladies, that, that astronaut was still John Glenn. It was John Glenn, right? John Glenn would still be floating around Absolutely. in space somewhere. Absolutely. And uh, so it was phenomenal. Now, you indicated that one of the ladies is still alive. Do you remember yeah, her I, name? Uh, I'm blanking her name right this second. Okay. I think it's uh, Catherine. Yes, it. That's I it. I can't remember her last name, yep. but yeah, it's mm -hmm. Catherine. Okay. Well, we need to look all of those ladies up yep. because the, the contribution that they made to this country definitely went without any kind of uh, credit at all. And uh, they probably not only saved that particular uh, flight, but they gave uh, birth to some other flights that took place too. Absolutely, that's right. So now th there were some other um, exhibits. Other, other features other in the features exhibit, in but the, let me yeah. say right quick, is one of the things that we have done to make sure that uh, the exhibit is not just a fun thing to view, is, is we have developed materials uh, that coincide with the social studies curriculum. Okay. And so it meets the standards for teaching social studies in the state of Georgia. So whenever our exhibit goes into schools, their materials are available to teachers to help young people become more familiar with those individuals okay. and hopefully will remember them going forward that it was just not an exercise. I got you. You see. You know, because we're going to run out of time. So I, I want you to talk just a little bit more, <coughs> excuse me, about some of the uh, 
the historic things that people don't know about. Well, Leroy Johnson, uh, his story, is, I'm endeared to him because of his courage. He was the first African-American to sit in the Georgia legislature. And in sitting him. and talking with him to put his piece together, he told me about the lonely days and mm -hmm. the lonely months and the lonely years when he would walk through those halls under the Gold Dome and no one would speak to him. Right. He would say good morning. They would look in his direction and grunt, maybe. And he, you know, with steadfast courage and tenacity, maintained his position. He was there to represent mm -hmm. his constituency, and he was going to do that mm -hmm. no matter what came. I, you I see. had the privilege of knowing him, and uh, so did you. And uh, one of the things that, that, that he doesn't get credit for uh, was being the attorney that got Muhammad Ali his license Absolutely. To, to fight again. Absolutely. You want to talk about that? Absolutely. You know, Muhammad Ali had been barred from boxing because of his stand on Vietnam Correct. and could not fight in this country. And so uh, they were looking for somewhere to stage a fight so that he could, you know, gain, gain his title again. And so he was approached um, to see if there was a possibility for him to fight in Georgia. And he found a loophole because he's an attorney by training. Right. He found a loophole in the law. And believe it or not, with the cooperation of Lester Maddox, had the opportunity to open the doors for Muhammad Ali to fight here in Georgia. And so the greatest became the greatest again right. because of Leroy Johnson. And I, I just love him for that. And he doesn't get credit for that. He does all. not. He does not. The, the, there was also, and I'm trying to remember exactly what it was with Ray Charles, because Ray Charles was banned also from Georgia at one point, wasn't he? It? Was, was it he okay. was, he was, he was. He refused to, you know, perform before mixed audiences. He, I mean, segregated audiences right. here. And so they banned him in Georgia that he could not, and if you watch the movie Ray, they touch on that subject. And they banned him from performing in Georgia until many, many years later. I can't recall the name of the legislature that got him uh, to be to be Probably recognized Julian in the Bond. House. Actually, Julian Bond, actually, perhaps. it wasn't Julian. Oh, it wasn't Julian. No, Ju uh, my understanding is that Julian played the part in the movie, but it was somebody out of uh, Augusta or somewhere down there that actually did it. But he played the part, mm -hmm. is what I understand. But but Julian, in his own right. He, he, he did a lot as well. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, but you had mentioned uh, Maynard Jackson, you know, who was obviously one of my, you know, mentors as he was yours. Uh, in fact, he was the reason I stayed in Atlanta when I got here because uh, I was ready to go. After, <laughs> after I saw, um, uh, what's the gentleman that was running for governor back when we first got here? Um, uh, yeah, you, you, you're thinking about uh, not Lester Maddox. No, but, wasn't Lester. Uh, it, um, but, but he he has he was out at that at, at Stone Mountain all the time. JB Stone. JB Stone. And JB's uh, motto was he was gonna get rid of crime in Georgia because he was sending <laughs> y'all back there. <laughs> that, that's not the word he used. That's not the word he used at all. And uh, you remember that? Yeah, I mean he was running TV ads, and they yeah. said it was that free speech allowed him to use the N word. So he basically said, "I'm sending all of the ends back to Africa." And that's how you're going to get rid of crime. <laughs> and they would well, come on TV well. uh, doing that campaign. Wow. Uh, this is the early 70s. So, yeah, wow. I recall very distinctly. Yeah. But but then uh, we both had the privilege of, of meeting Manny Jackson. And I want you to talk a little bit about, because he did some historic things, too, in, in, in Atlanta and in Georgia. Uh, the whole concept around, as I understand it, the whole concept around uh, affirmative, no, not affirmative action, but uh, minority participation yeah. in these contracts. That mainly birthed that. Is that? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the reason that Atlanta has become the city that it has is because of Maynard Jackson. Absolutely. And Maynard took a hard stand when it was really tough. Number one, not one bank in Atlanta had an African American on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's my story. None right? of them had an African American that were vice presidents, that, and a vice president at a bank level is usually somebody who's running a branch. Mm -hmm. And so Maynard uh, went to all of the leaders of the banks and said, look, I want you to hire at least one African-American as a vice president, just one, and I want you to put one African-American on your board. And they balked at that. And Maynard basically said, I will move every dime that the city of Atlanta has to Birmingham banks. Uh, and after a while, they all you know, fell in line. 
and you ended up with an African American on every bank board, which made a difference. And you had, ended up with African Americans hired as vice presidents mm -hmm. at these banks. You began to open up the process. The airport was something that the business community really wanted, and, and Maynard fought very, very hard to ensure that there was participation. His uh, commitment was to 25% minority participation. And of course, um, you know, Roger and I were in college working with Maynard as he was going through this, and it wasn't easy. If you mm -hmm. go back and look at the historic record, you realize he was being vilified on a mm -hmm. daily basis by the daily newspapers. And yet, uh, Atlanta, Hartsfield, Jackson wouldn't have been built if it hadn't been for his efforts. And because of inclusion and opening up both the economic system and the opportunities in Atlanta, I think it sparked much of the growth that we see now. And my understanding is the airport was built uh, on time, or actually ahead of time, and under and budget. And under budget. And, uh, and I think that was in large part because of the inclusion. Everybody felt a piece of it, a part of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's other stories like that that we have. And I know you have some more stories too, right? Well, you know, I'm thinking about this conversation and how, why it's just so important for our young people to understand our history in this state. This last governor's race when we had uh, Stacey Abrams running for mm -hmm. governor and, you know, um, a lot of people looked at it as an anomaly, that this was some strange thing that was happening. But if you study, you know, the stories of Maynard Jackson and all the others that came before her, you mm -hmm. could understand why. She was really just standing on their shoulders, mm -hmm. quite frankly. It, that was a natural for somebody, African, an African American, to run mm -hmm. for the highest office in this state. I, absolutely. And I, I guess it's a, a, probably a story for another time to, to understand exactly what happened with that election, and we're going to deal with that, too. <laughs> Tell us about some more historic things that you are aware of, that where we've contributed, where African Americans have contributed to this country, but didn't get credit for it. Well, that was the whole purpose of the patent office. A lot of the inventions that we have were done by people of color, and if you had to have money to get a patent to claim it as your own, you were out of luck. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of these inventions were patented under other people's names because they were either working for them or they owned them. But uh, one person I would like to talk about is Mary Ellen Pleasant. Uh, she was a biracial lady. Uh, she worked in a laundry and she moved out to California and she opened her own restaurant and she became a successful millionaire and she okay. actually gave funds to uh, John Brown uh, okay. right, to do the raid. Uh, so she's overlooked and a lot of people aren't mm -hmm. familiar with who she is. Mm -hmm. You know, there's also Eliza Greer who was the first African-American female to be licensed to practice medicine here in Georgia. And I think about her story, and then I, and I think about the president of the Morehouse School of Medicine now, who's a female as well. She stands on Eliza Greer's shoulder. And Eliza Greer's story is fascinating. You know, she was a newly emancipated slave, and she picked cotton one year to pay for her tuition, and she went to school the next. And she kept that dynamic going until she finished medical school and was awarded her license to practice medicine here in Georgia. So I think Eliza Greer's story is fascinating as well. And I'd like to just add one quick point. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the Black History Month and we are needing to be more than Black History Month, but of course I'm old enough to remember when it was Negro History Week uh -huh. and Carter G. Whitson started it because there was no discussion of the contributions that African Americans have made or how we fit in from a historical perspective. And he also uh, was the editor of the Journal of uh, Negro History. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After he passed away, uh, Dr. Alton B. Hornsby, who was my professor at Morehouse, my history professor at Morehouse, became the editor of the journal. He brought it down here to Atlanta, so it was actually being published here in Atlanta. And then he published his most famous book. He published a number of books. But we were just talking about Maynard Jackson. He published a book called Black Power in Dixie, mm -hmm. uh, which is really the seminal book uh, of the history of the era we're talking about where Maynard fought for opportunity for African-Americans here in Georgia. So mm -hmm. we have a real rich uh, heritage right here in Georgia of uh, making sure that African-American history is brought forward. And, you know, it's not just for us. It's not just for African Americans. Last year we were in residence with the exhibit over at Woodward Academy. Mm -hmm. Woodward Academy is about 80 percent uh, white. And the majority of the young people that came through that exhibit were white. 
They wow. were white. They were Caucasians. Mm -hmm. And they were fascinated by our stories. And, and so I reach out. Uh, I try to, to find those audiences of young people that are diversified so that they, too, can you know, become acclimated to what our history is in this state. We're not just targeting African-American uh, communities. We, we need to make sure that our communities know what's going on. We've got about maybe 10 minutes left. Okay. We got a couple of uh, questions that came in from, you know, we're shooting this live, okay? And a couple of people uh, sent questions. Anybody that knows the answer, go for it. Um, this one says, it's from Richard, uh, we just used the first name. Um, what, what do you know about Sam Cooke's involvement and uh, and stance for civil rights? I, I used to like Sam Cooke's music, <laughs> I know that. Do you, do you know yeah, you know? I, as a matter of fact, there, you know, interestingly enough, I think uh, there's been some recent work, and I think there's a documentary out there right now documentary. Uh, about Sam Cooke, because Sam Cooke was very close to uh, Malcolm X. He was also very close to uh, Muhammad Ali. He also took a very strong stand on civil rights. And of course, his last song that actually came out uh, after he passed away uh, was uh, Change Is Gonna mm -hmm. Come, which became the anthem of the civil rights mm -hmm. movement. So he had a real uh, powerful influence in that area. And like a lot of uh, R&B singers of that era, they, they, they uh, hosted concerts to raise money. That's right. You yeah, know, absolutely. to support the foot soldiers who were out there on the on the front lines. I think Nina Simone was an excellent example. Indeed, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. indeed. And, and and we talked about Ray Charles earlier too. You know, I think a lot of us saw that movie about him too, where he took that stance. Absolutely. Uh, so I think a, a good number, of, as you said, a good number of our artists mm -hmm. uh, took stands, and uh, some of them probably suffered, you know, economically for for having done so. And uh, but here's another question. And I'm not sure I understand this question, but it says basically uh, about the youth today. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, is, is are, are they as interested in the history of black? You know, I think the way they're wording this is that they want to know, based on your interaction uh, with youth, how are they feeling about their history? Um, I see a disconnect. Um, and it's not just with history, it's with a lot of issues that are going on because we're so consumed with what's going on right now that there's so much on my plate, I can't worry about the past. I need to adjust and deal with what's happening and what's going on with me right now and the issues that are going on in the community uh, right now. We were speaking earlier, uh, police brutality, uh, mental illness. A lot of these kids have issues that were not relatable to what happened. They don't have to worry about going to segregated restrooms or water fountains. And so they don't necessarily see the value of black history mm -hmm. firsthand. You know, last week we hosted the Ron Clark Academy here uh, at the Capitol for the exhibit and I was absolutely impressed with those young people. The eagerness and the passion that they felt for what they were viewing, it, it really, really, it, it, changed my, it changed my whole outlook on young people. And, you know, I left the Dome last week uh, feeling that the future was in pretty good hands because I had just experienced some young people uh, who I did not know existed because I never hear about the best part of us. Yes. You see. Yes. The, you know, the, the question also comes up about, well, every other ethnic group that went through bad things in this country, there were some sort of reparations. You want to talk about that? Why, I, I, why, 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 why is it that that has not happened in our community? Well, you know, we, we never got our 40 acres in the mule. Absolutely. Actually, I'd rather have 40 acres <laughs> in, in a Cadillac. But, <laughs> but, but seriously, you know, you want to talk about that? Well, you know, you know the, the issue of reparations have been visited before. And it seems like every time it's visited, it's shot, it's shot down. Um, quite frankly, I don't think that America could repay the African-American community for its contribution to this country. I don't think that there is money enough to make good, you know, on the atrocities that were visited upon our race as a people. I really do not. Mm -hmm. Good idea, but I don't know how possible that would be. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I agree with that. I don't think that it's possible 
to fully repair, but I do think that it's important to deal with the disparities that continue to exist. And I think that there are a number of areas where there needs to be targeted investment to erase those disparities mm -hmm. of wealth, uh, in terms of health disparities, and in terms of um, basically uh, our problems with overcriminalization in our mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. uh, and mass incarceration, and all of those have to be addressed aggressively mm -hmm. through public policy. Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, know that if it's politically possible today to get uh, just one fell swoop of rep reparations mm -hmm. as people visualize it. But I think it is possible to deal with uh, racial equity. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of my work involves ensuring that we uh, begin to address the disparities that exist and mm -hmm. find mechanisms for the government mm -hmm. to take an active stance to ensure that there's equity and fairness. And I think that to the extent that we do that, uh, we begin to repair some of the mm -hmm. uh, ongoing issues we have. The, the law likes to call it two things. They like to say that there is discrimination and there are the present effects of past discrimination. Mm -hmm. And both of them have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I like what you said about the mass incarceration. And in fact, that was just to uh, supplement them losing their slaves. And it is in the 13th Amendment. We're going to abolish slavery except for uh, being punished in crime. So right. uh, that just replaced slavery in essence as an institution and we just call it incarceration today. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, the guy who wrote that book, Slavery by Another Name, who mm -hmm. did a lot of that research, mm -hmm. used to be the uh, city hall reporter for the Atlanta mm -hmm. Journal Constitution. Mm -hmm. And then he was at the Wall Street Journal. He's, he's still here in Atlanta actually. Mm -hmm. Still Doug based Blackman. in Atlanta. Doug Blackman. Mm -hmm. And he did a lot of original research on that to basically prove what uh, was, you know, is pretty much common knowledge now, but it wasn't common knowledge before he mm -hmm. put that book out. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of other things that are really critical that we're facing right now that can be traced to direct, directly to those decisions that were made to keep us in a position, mm -hmm. as Thurgood Marshall said to the Supreme Court, in a position as close as possible to our former condition of servitude. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Carol Anderson over at Emory University mm -hmm. wrote White mm -hmm. Rage. Yes. And in that book, she exposes so many things that have been done to the African-American community as late as the 1980s mm -hmm. in the Iran-Contra mm -hmm. scandal and about how uh, basically Reagan uh, allowed drugs to be put into the black community mm -hmm. right. in order to funnel money uh, to the Contras mm -hmm. uh, in for Nicaragua guns, yes, for guns. Absolutely. And she, she details that in her book. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot about black history that has to be explored uh, to deal with some of these issues. Right. We, we, we're going to wrap it up in a minute, but before we do, I wanted to give each of you a chance to make any last comment or statements you'd like to make. Um, well, you know, I'd like to say that our history, African-American history, is vibrant and, and well uh, in our arena. Not only doing February uh, Black History Month, but at least nine months out of the year when school is open, we're there. Uh, when there are other public programs that are... Uh, particular to the history and culture of African Americans in this country, we're there. So we're working very hard to make sure that our history is just not a celebratory subject matter. Now, now is, is the exhibit that you've been talking about, is that on display somewhere It's now? actually traveling. We're in Athens this month. And okay. so it is a traveling exhibit. It's not a permanent exhibit that's housed anywhere. And certainly that's something that may develop and come a little later. Okay. But we're in the... Um, athens clark county library system okay. this month well i would say as far as education i think it's going to come a time where we're going to have to revise the curriculum we only talk about people in color in a means of oppression subjugation or enslavement and the point of history is to draw inspiration and encouragement and it's kind of hard to do when you're only talked about in a negative manner and i think that's why if we incorporate the positive things that minorities have contributed to this country, we will not just be uh, better mentally, but people of other races will start to look at us differently mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a, a big point, I, and I like that what you're saying. You know, our history is usually talked about in a negative sense. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we talk about slavery, we talk about, all this, but we have a lot that's positive, and I appreciate that statement. Yeah, and the only thing I'd like to say is I think that we are in a period where there are, is a lot of quality original research being done by young uh, African-American history scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I subscribe to the uh, African-American Intellectual History Society. 
and there is a lot of new scholarship that's coming out there. A lot of really great young PhDs that are coming out and coming on the scene that are writing interesting parts of our history that had not been previously explored. And I think that is, uh, for those people who are really interested in it, it's great to dig into some of that. Well, I really appreciate you guys coming. And this has been a, a great conversation. And it's one of those conversations, just like 30, well, 28 days is not <laughs> right. enough uh, to talk about black history, neither is 30 minutes. Right. Um, but the, the reality is that I hope that the people who've seen this uh, got something that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that we can do this again, you know, one day that you guys can come back mm -hmm. and we can continue the conversation. Um, because it's important that, that people understand. And just, you know, as we close it, um, er, I believe that at the beginning of the uh, video, there's going to be uh, where I was talking about right here in this capital, that there were uh, 32 African Americans uh, that were serving in this General Assembly that were kicked out mm. simply because mm. they were black mm -hmm. and there was no other reason for it. They mm -hmm. were just black. They said, well, this is all during the reconstruction. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to mm -hmm. be bothered and y'all out of here. Mm -hmm. They kicked them out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, uh, again, thank you guys for coming. Absolutely. I mean, I My feel pleasure. Uh, very enlightened by what you had to say. And uh, I want our viewers to, to, to understand that everybody's busy and working hard to preserve our history mm -hmm. and to communicate it. And uh, please continue to watch Under the Gold Dome.